Hey guys, welcome to Data Track, your one stop channel for all the data science and machine learning updates. In today's video, we will look at the ongoing research areas around conversational LLMs. After the arrival of ChatGPT and BARD, it's been some time and lot of research is going around these conversational LLMs. And if I have to categorize the research areas, I would categorize it as one trying to improve or make better the, the architecture of LLMs. When I say make better, it's more around making it more scalable and faster. The second research area is making the LLMs more accurate, the output to be more precise. And third research areas would be addressing social and ethical issues, basically mitigating all the bias, toxicity and harmful output that it can emit. And also I will highly recommend the other two videos in my channel that I have made. One was on how the architecture of conversational LLMs was designed about the GPT model and how GPT was fine tuned to make chat GPT. And the second video is more around the open source LLMs and as well as what are these harmful and uh, toxic outputs that it can seldom produce. What are the biases that LLMs have and uh, how to use them efficiently. But in this video, we will look at the ongoing research around conversational LLM. So let's get started. Uh, before we get started, I will do a quick recap of the training process for conversational LLMs. Conversational LLMs as a chat GPT or BARD are based on transformer architecture. This is the transformer architecture where this is the encoder part and this is the decoder part. The input words goes through uh, the input and also they, have, they are injected with the positional encodings and positional encodings are like the position embeddings which add the information of relative position of the word in the input uh, sentence. So conversational LLMs like ChatGPT or BART are based on transformer architecture. These conversational LLMs are built on top of GPT model and GPT model was trained on next word prediction in an autoregressive way on the entire internet data. The base GPT model was then fine tuned using a meticulously meticulously designed question answering data set and we got chat GPT because the GPT model is very advanced but it's trained to predict the next word but with conversational LLMs we want to do the conversations question answering so the GPT model was taken and fine tuned using a meticulously designed question answering data set and we got chat GPT. The fine tuning process also incorporates additional optimization such as training a reward model to assess the quality of output and utilizing proximal policy optimizations, PPO and reinforcement learning to strike the balance between exploit and explore trade-off. And I have covered this process of fine tuning and use of reward model and PPO uh, in a very detailed way in my other video about the uh, architecture of GPT and chat GPT models. I will add the link of those video also in the description section. You can look uh, through them for a detailed uh, explanation and these optimizations like PPO and reward model continuously improve the uh, chat GPT model and enhance its conversational capabilities and some of the uh, popular conversational LLMs that we currently have are chat GPT, BARD AI from Google, chat GPT from OpenAI and uh, Hugging Chat also has uh, launched a open source version of uh, 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 conversational LLMs and it's also pretty good. Now coming to the main agenda of this video, we want to understand that since the arrival of this model, there's been some time, what are the development and research around LLMs going around? So I have categorized them into three categories. The first one is improving the efficiency and scalability of LLM architecture, basically making the LLM architecture more scalable and uh, efficient. The second is how can, can we enhance the accuracy and diversity of LLM. This is more around making the output of LLMs even better. And uh, the third one is addressing the ethical and social challenges of LLMs. We have also in my last, there is one more video on ChatGPT where I have talked about all the biases. Here also we will talk about them, but how, what are the research going around uh, mitigating the, some of these biases uh, and uh, toxic uh, outputs as well as harmful information that it can produce. Okay, we will see all of these in details and also there is there might be some synergies between these categorization but overall these are the three categories. One is improving the architecture, second is making the LLMs more accurate, their output to be more uh, better and third is how can we address the ethical and social challenges of LLMs and make its output more fair. So first of all we will look at the 
efficiency and scalability of LLM architecture. The first optimization or research area is going around increasing the context window up to 100k input tokens. So let's see that in details. Okay, let's first understand the large context window. Uh, what are the research going around it? So ChatGPT started with a context window of 4000 tokens. Now, if we have a longer context window, it will allow LLM to better understand and process lengthy complex text such as a whole academia article that we can provide in the input or legal contracts or novels. Currently, there is a limitation because of this 4K token context window. There is only limited number of words we can pass in the input. But if we have a larger context window, let's say up to 100K um, input tokens, then we can pass very le uh, lengthy and complex text such as academia article, legal contracts and novels. It will also enable the LLM to handle more diverse and challenging tasks that require long context like long documentation, summarization, multi-hop questions or retrieval augmented question answering. What is retrieval augmented question answering? We will see in details but it's mostly that uh, whenever you are answering a question also take a reference of the web, web pages or database and uh, use that as a context in the input only. So we have seen that if the longer context window is there then most many of this uh, processing can be done in a better way. However, a bigger context window also poses challenges that is it will increase the computational cost and complexity of LLM and as well as memory and latency requirements. So how is this large context window uh, still uh, achieved or how it can still be achieved? So we can use some trips, tricks and techniques. So key ingredients that will make it possible to use a bigger context window compromises uh, of a variety of techniques and tricks and the first trick is train a model on 2k tokens only and fine tune it on longer context that is the first trick second trick could be replace the positional sinusoidal embeddings with alibi motivated positional embedding so we will look it into more detail so this is the transformer architecture we can see here that positional embeddings are injected and this positional embedding currently which are used are sinusoidal uh, embedding in the original transformer po paper, positional sinusoidal embedding were added, were summed with the input tokens at the, bottom, at the bottom of the architecture to add information about the ordering of the words, that is their relative position of the words. However, this positional sinusoidal encoding doesn't extrapolate well when it comes to longer context due to the cyclic nature of embeddings because the sine and cosine waves are cyclic. Because of the cyclic nature of these uh, embeddings they don't extrapolate well with longer context. So what this technique Alawai paper which is attention with linear biases suggests is it uses the trick to remove the positional sinusoidal embedding and replace it with another positional embedding. And what is that positional embedding with, which it will replace it with? The positional applied, this positional embedding is applied in the attention head and not on the bottom of the network. So we will remove the positional embedding from the bottom and apply it in the attention head itself. And it biases query key attention scores with a penalty that is proportional to their distance. So basically in the attention we know query and key vectors are multiplied. So when that mul this multiplication happens we will also add one more uh, matrix to it which will be the positional embedding and this matrix will add penalty that is proportional to the distance between words. So basically what it is saying when you are doing a self attention, uh, if you attend to a word which is larger from yourself, then there will be a higher penalty and that penalty is proportional to the distance between the words. Uh, so if this is the first word for if it attends to itself, no penalty, but if, as it attends to the uh, other words which are uh, further away from it, the penalty increases. You can see here, for example, this the fourth a position word no penalty for itself but if it attends to the first word minus one penalty and second word minus two minus three minus four and so on and also there is this m parameter which is like a slope that can uh, that can be learned so this is the technique uh, uh, after uh, this is the technique which can better the positional embedding and help it extrapolate well for larger context windows third technique to uh, that can be a key ingredient towards increasing the context window will be sparse attention. The idea behind sparse attention is that not all tokens in the context of size 100 are relevant to each other. 
So a word doesn't need to attend to all other words. The goal of adding the sparsity is to reduce the number of computations and there are several approaches how to select the connection between tokens. The first can be sliding window attention which employs a fixed size window attention surrounding each token that is for a word just you can uh, attend to K word on your left and K word on your right and similarly for every other word in a, in a sliding window fashion. There can be other techniques also like there are graph based methods to represent the relationship between elements. Here the first one is uh, the local attention which can be like sliding window and other, this other one is the graph based attention. But the main idea of both the approaches is that uh, a word doesn't need to attend to all other words. It can just uh, attend to a few words in its close affinity and uh, this will reduce the number of computer computations and that's the main idea of sparse attention. Next key ingredient which can make this longer context window possible is flash attention. You might have heard uh, that uh, term flash attention a lot in LinkedIn where people are posting about the research around flash attention. So now let's understand what flash attention is. Also before that let's understand the GPU uh, memories hierarchy. At the lowest level there is main memory and then there is GPU high bandwidth memory and at the lowest level is the GPU SRAM. GPU SRAM is the fastest memory followed by GPU HBM followed by main memory. But uh, in terms of size main memory is larger and followed by HBM and followed by SRAM. So basically SRAM is a smaller memory but uh, the processing is very fast. Its throughput is very fast. And let's look at the standard attention implementation. We know that in attention what happens is the key and query vectors they are multiplied and we get for each word how much it needs to attend to other words and the uh, that that uh, that key and query multiplication is passed through a softmax that will get give us a normalized score and value vector of the word will uh, take into account the other words in it, it needs to attend to in that proportion what the softmax tells so that is the uh, overall architecture of uh, self attention let's look at the standard implementation of uh, attention mechanism in GPU. So it says there are three matrices Q, K and V and load Q and K which is query and key to the uh, SRAM do the multiplication Q, K transpose and write it back to high bandwidth memory and again read it back to the SRAM and perform a softmax and uh, then again write back to high bandwidth memory and then load P and V from high bandwidth memory and what if P and V are P, P is actually the softmax and V was the value vector P and then do the output which is P cross V so same thing first Q and Q are multiplied save to high bandwidth memory again loaded put a softmax to it save to high bandwidth memory and then uh, the values P which was the output of softmax is multiplied by the value vector and again write return to the high bandwidth memory so lot of reading writing happens. So the main problem in the attention layer with respect to GPU memory utilization is intermediate multiplication result P, S and O that are large in size N cross N. N cross N because uh, the multiplication is of size N cross N because it needs it stores how much importance each word needs to give to all other words and that is done for all the words. So that's why it's N cross N and it's uh, saved every time in high bandwidth memory and read again calculated uh, then we calculate softmax and then we again write it and again read it and finally do the output right and again write it to high bandwidth memory. These large intermediate matrix are needed or saved for the backward pass because we could have directly calculated the softmax and then saved but also the intermediate result is saved for the backward pass uh, that will be helpful in while learning the gradients. And the main bottleneck of uh, attention mechanism is this uh, back and forth writing and reading which flash attention attempts to solve and how let's look at it. So flash attention is a technique that modifies the attention mechanism of LLM to reduce the number of memory reads and writes between GPU high bandwidth memory and GPU on chip SRAM static RAM. So the two tricks flash attention uses are flash attention works by using tiling to divide the attention computation into smaller sub problems that can fit into SRAM and compute the softmax reduction without assessing the whole input. So let's understand it. What is tiling? Tiling divides the query key and value matrices into smaller blocks so that not the whole uh, 
vector or whole matrix needs to be uploaded only a block of it can be uh, uploaded to the SRAM and secondly it does the softmax reduction so basically it doesn't need uh, the whole uh, whole input to be available to calculate the softmax if we know the softmax formula in the denominator we need the contribution of all the inputs that is all other words with respect to this word but there is a technique by which this reduction can be done by the use of some parameter alpha and beta that can be saved in the forward pass and so on. So, so there is a technique just you can understand briefly that there is a technique by which this softmax reduction can happen even with the tiling even after uh, dividing the query key and value matrix into smaller blocks still the softmax calculation can happen and there is some softmax reduction techniques which allows that. So this is the first trick that not read the whole entire input matrix just read block of it and still there is a, a trick by which we can calculate the softmax and second technique is this is during mostly the backward pass we knew that large intermediate attention matrix uh, we are saved right in the previous standard uh, attention implementation so that it can be used in backward pass but in flash attention uh, we saw we do tiling we calculate the softmax and then save it so we don't store the intermediate matrix the reason being uh, in the backward parts also instead of we saving and it reading we can we will recompute and it's found that because of this recomputation again happening in the backward pass the flops floating point operations might increase but the time reduces because we are not uh, back and forth reading between uh, high bandwidth memory and SRAM we will recompute if needed but we want again read from high bandwidth memory which might increase the flop but overall time reduces so, so these are the two tricks that flash attention uses and flash attention can also be extended to block or sparse attention the sparse attention we saw where instead of attending to all other words it can just attend to uh, some some set of words it flash attention can be combined to further reduce the computation and memory cost so this is the next key ingredient which can make the longer context window possible other key ingredient which has made this longer context window possible is multi query attention the original transformer architecture is based on multi-head attention where each heads we know this key value uh, multiplication happens and then softmax is calculated which is multiplied with the value uh, matrix and so on uh, and there are multiple heads and each head it has its own key value and query matrices now with multi-query attention we are saying that since the original multi-head paper has a separate K and value matrix in every head with multi query attention, uh, variant of multi head attention, we can just use one key value uh, head instead of multiple ones. So basically, for all the multiple heads, query vector will be different, but not the key and value. Key and value vectors will be same. So because key and value vectors are same, so key and value matrices will be the same. And this will uh, still be, and there will still be multi query heads, as I was telling. So we would have to keep only two matrices of size n cross k, k and n cross v and previously this was actually h into n cross k which was number of heads but now that h term has gone away a big model that could have previously had 96 heads uh, in multi head attention now with multi query attention we can still have 96 heads but only two matrix for key and value will be needed so it's a 96 x memory uh, will be reduced but query vector will still be there that will bring the variability and uh, that will uh, make it allow it to learn complex patterns but key and value matrix will keep it same for all the heads. Multi query attention can achieve similar quality to multi head attention but with much faster inference time much faster because we have reduced the, the number of key and value matrices we have made it common so there is less amount of data needs that needs to be passed to the SRAM of GPU and because of this memory saving it uh, and and the memory saving reducing the number of read, read and write uh, we are able to do a faster inference so still with larger context window the inference time goes down because of shared uh, key and value in multi query attention layer uh, next key ingredient which can make the longer context window possible is conditional computation so what conditional computation does is uh, it tries to reduce the floating point opera operations further by employing a conditional computation that avoids applying all model, model parameters to all the tokens from the input sequence. So basically what we are saying, it's a technique which says that we will 
not apply all the model parameters to all the, all the tokens because in the sparse attention we have seen that all tokens are not important some tokens are more important than others so same thing following the same intuition but qualified paper which is conditional a computation paper from google research and it's a latest research from 2023 so these are all the latest research things the qualified paper from google research says that all the feed forward and attention computation will be distributed into two branches heavy and light you can see this is the uh, light branch and heavy branch light layer will be applied to all the tokens and the heavy ones only to important ones so there will be some routing some tokens might be passed through a heavy uh, route heavy branch out but rest of the tokens which might not be very important and that the model will learn how to find importance uh, they will only be passed through the light layers and this approach will speed up the overall training and inference process because for the uh, not so important tokens you will directly pass it through the light layers and only for the important ones you will pass it through a denser uh, heavy branch so this is the main idea of conditional computations and most of these ideas that I am uh, I am discussing like splash attention, conditional computation, sparse attention and so on to understand in more depth you can read the paper but from my idea is that you can get a brief about the techniques so that later you can learn or read it in more details. Uh, next key ingredient which can make this longer context window possible is larger RAM GPUs. So to fit a large context more memory is needed so larger RAM in GPU is needed and that is possible if we use some kind of like 80 GB, 800 GPUs which have higher memory. So idea is uh, use a GPU with larger RAM or larger memory. So till now what we have seen is that how can we improve the scalability of LLM architecture make enable large context window of 200 input tokens by doing a lot of smart adjustments and which were larger RAM GPU, conditional computation, using multi query attention instead of multi head attention, using use of flash attention which is which implements the standard attention in GPU in a more optimized way, uh, sparse attention that is not do, attending to all the words while finding the importance of a particular word and using alibi positional encoding instead of the positional sinusoidal embedding that the original transfer paper uses and uh, other thing was like instead of what we can do is we can train on on 2k tokens only but we can do a fine tuning on a longer context so these are some of the uh, advanced and sophisticated but clever tricks and techniques that we have seen which can enable a scalable architecture and still allow us a larger context window up to 100k input tokens and we saw that larger context window can help uh, process complex tasks and lengthy documents like the whole novel or a research paper and so on and we can then still do question answering on it. The next uh, set of techniques which are also used to scale the LLM architecture are reducing the cost and memory footprints using pruning, distillation, quantization and sparsification techniques. So let's look at them into a uh, bit more detail. What is pruning? Pruning in LLM is a technique that aims to reduce the size of size and complexity of LLMs. And how it does that? It does by removing some of the weights or parameters which might not be very important. Pruning in LLMs can done at different levels of weights uh, or even the layers can be pruned. So it can be done at different layers of weights, neurons or layers and depending on what activations, gradients, redundancy are important. So basically you can see what are the activations produced because of a layer. If higher activations are produced, it means it's an important layer. We should not remove it. But for some other layer, if their activations are not very high, then we can remove it. So in this way, looking at activations, gradients or their importance or if they are redundant, then remove it. So looking at these parameters, some pruning happens. And because of this pruning, the model becomes smaller and uh, we can uh, uh, do training and inference faster. Next technique is distillation. Distillation in LLM is a technique that transfers the knowledge or skills of a large language model into a smaller model which are easy to deploy and use. So distillation in LLMs can improve the performance and efficiency of smaller models as well as reduce rate training data in time. So basically there is a teacher model which is a large LLM model and we can still uh, get lot of its accuracy in a smaller model using knowledge distillation training where uh, even the training data and time reduces when we train a smaller model from the larger model using this knowledge distillation technique and I have a video upcoming on this topic which I will add uh, in the description once I release it which is more around knowledge distillation how can 
different type of knowledge distillation models training happens and so on uh, and also sparsification which is sparse attention we have already seen that in, in the larger context window uh, side also one very interesting technique which is nowadays getting popularity is quantization and it's very simple but very efficient technique quantization in llm is a technique that reduces the precision or bit width of the weights and activations of llm such as using 8 bit or 4 bit integer instead of 32 bit floating point numbers so basically we know the there are weights parameters of a neural network which are floating point numbers 32 bit let's reduce them and make it a then 8 bit and 4 bit but how 8 bit 4 bit integers how can we represent floating point numbers in terms of integers and that to just 8 bit and 4 bit so that's the beauty of quantization quantization how it does that it helps reduce the memory consumption and computational cost of LLMs and accelerate the inference speed. How it does that, we'll understand with an example. Suppose we want to quantize a floating point number in the range of minus 1 to plus 1 to an unsigned 8 bit integer in the range of 0 to 255. Let's take uh, weights which are, in, which are in range of minus 1 to plus 1. It can be 0 0.23587, seven, something, anything like that. But it's in between minus 1 to 1 range, and those are floating point numbers. And we want to represent it as 8-bit integer. 8-bit integer means values between 0 to 256, right? That is uh, 0 to 256 numbers, 0 to 255. Now, uh, it's simple mathematics. Like it will be a mapping from one range to another range. So for that, we need to find the scale and zero point that map the floating point range to integer range. So how we will find the scale? Very simple. What is the max range of uh, floating point numbers max real minus min real real means the real uh, data which is uh, this real data points max real minus min real divided by max int minus min int we know that max real here is 1 and minus 1 and min is minus 1 and max int is 255 min int is 0 so the scaling factor we will get it with that is what is every uh, incremental value in this range how much should it scale in the uh, 0 to 255 range so we get the scale factor now zero point also we calculate what is zero point we say that values are between minus one to plus one so also zero will be somewhere in between right when the real value takes value zero what will be the value of uh, integer range so zero point is nothing if you work out the mathematics it comes out as min int minus round min real by scale and here it comes 128 and it's very pretty uh, evident right minus 1 to 1 0 is the midpoint 0 to 255 midpoint around 128 so 128 uh, will be uh, here when we get 0 it will be mapped to 128 so we need to find these two numbers which are scale and 0 point and once we have these two we can simply convert any real values to it integer range that is using this formula round real value by scale plus 0 point and any integer back to its real value by integer value minus 0 point into a scale so simple mathematics uh, transforming one range to another uh, it helps uh, storing this 32 bit floating points numbers into 8 bit and 4 bit definitely there will be some rounding error some loss of accuracy but we can still uh, fine tune or or even if we don't do fine tune we can do a simple inference of this large language models in our local system which may not have a very huge computation because we want to store them in 32 bit uh, uh, floating point numbers the weights but we will store them into 8 bit or 4 bit integers and the memory requirements for fine tuning or inference reduces a lot with some loss in accuracy and there are two main types of quantization one is post training quantization other is quantization aware training in post training quantization the quantization happens after the training stage and only affects the inference stage post training quantization in sim is simpler and faster to apply but may result in larger accuracy loss compared to quantization aware so what we are saying once the model is trained we will just represent all the weights in 8 bit quantization in the inference so that's why just doing it on the inference time it may be simpler and faster but more accuracy loss while compared to quantization aware training where uh, both in training and inference the quantization happens basically conversion of integer to real real to integer all those conversion keeps on happening in training and inference which makes the training process complex and slower but result in smaller accuracy loss because the training purpose is to reduce the loss with quantization right so these are the two things one can we can do just quantization of a trained model or we can
do quantization also in training and inference to, to make a quantization aware model. Uh, next technique which is also becoming very popular is LoRa based training, fine tuning of LLMs. So LoRa stands for low rank adoption of large language model. It's a parameter efficient fine tuning method for LLM that uses low rank decompositions or metric decomposition to reduce the number of trainable parameters and the storage requirement. Same same idea that uh, uh, we need we may have to do a fine tuning in a, a machine with lesser computation. Let's use this technique LoRa which will do some matrix decomposition or low rank decomposition and reduce the number of parameters for which the, uh, we need to uh, train, fine tune. So trainable parameters will reduce and uh, the basic idea of LoRa is to decompose the weight changes of each layer of an LLM into product of two low rank matrices like the typical uh, matrix decomposition that so that instead of fine tuning the entire weight matrix the way LoRa will only need to learn and store a small set of uh, original parameters while maintaining or improving the performance and quality of an LLM. We'll see with an example that why uh, we don't need to uh, learn a lot of parameters. We will reduce the number of trainable parameters or learnable parameters by a lot using this technique of matrix decomposition. We'll see with an example but that's the main idea that number of trainable parameters will be reduced because of matrix factorization. And as soon as a new task or domain appears with limited resources, uh, we can still fine tune and get a higher efficiency because of this LoRa uh, way of training, which is low rank adoption of large language models. Now let's understand why this matrix decomposition uh, reduces the number of parameters. Suppose we have a layer of an LLM with weight matrix W of size 100 cross 100. This means W has 10,000 elements or parameters. If we want to fine tune this layer, we need to learn and store another matrix delta W, which will have the gradients of W, right? So delta W, which which, which will be of same size, which will be of size same size, which is 10,000 elements. So the total number of parameters needed are 20,000. 10,000 of the original weight matrix needs to be stored, and 10,000 the delta W, which is the gradients with respect to W. But what LoRa will do? It will reduce the number of parameters by decomposing. Uh, the gradient matrix into two smaller matrix u and v where u and v could be of size 100 cross 10. So if you see that that means 100 cross 10 in thousands so, num so only the number of learnable trainable parameters are 1000. So in total number of parameters are 12,000, 10,000 of the original w and uh, 1000 of u and 1000 of v so total 2000 for u and v in total 12,000. Previously what was 20,000 and reduced to 12,000. The size of u and v is much smaller than w which means LoRa requires much less storage space and few parameters to learn. Also here I assumed 10. This is the R parameter rank. The rank parameter R can be large or small and it will control the trade-off between model size and model quality. If we increase R, the model size will increase, quality will also increase but if we reduce uh, R, then model size will reduce and model quality will also degrade. So this is the trade-off. The a large R means more expressive power but more parameters while a smaller R means less expressive power but fewer parameters. We already understood the mathematics how delta W is divided into two matrix U and V and how it reduces number of parameters but let's go even deeper and understand with simple mathematics uh, how it happens. So let's consider a single layer of LLM with weight matrix W and let the loss function be squared error. So Y is the output target variable minus WX, X is the input square. We have assumed the loss function to be squared error. Now delta W we are saying that we will decompose it in as a multiplication of two matrix which is U and V transpose. So delta W is decomposed into U and V. It initially U and V matrix are initialized randomly and then they are updated iteratively to minimize the loss function. So we will take u and v matrix with some random values and with the gradient descent we will uh, iteratively minimize the loss. But we are assuming delta w is equal to u v transpose. Now what is the gradient of loss uh, gradient of loss function with respect to u which is uh, delta u is equal to uh, d loss by dw which is taking a derivative of loss function with respect to w and with chain rule w with respect to u. So when we take with uh, respect to w, it will be 2 y minus wx, 1 minus sign will come out and dw by du. What will this be? If we look at this, dw by du will nothing but it will be the v matrix. Similarly for 
delta v will be u matrix just this remaining thing will remain same just we will get replaced by u right now we need to update the parameters u will be equal to u minus alpha into delta u v equal to u minus alpha into delta v this is the gradient descent and the new weight will be w new equal to w old plus this new, uh, uv because uv we have already done the gradient descent so this is the updated weight matrix so we have seen that we just uh, this delta u and delta v we are still able to get the get the uh, changed w and with much lesser parameters here we have just applied to one layer but it can be applied to any layer of llm that is a weight matrix such as feed forward layers attention layers or embedding layers so in total it reduces the size of the entire uh, model uh, by a huge factor so we have already completed the first part where we looked at the methodologies tip tricks and techniques that are used to make the architecture more scalable and efficient we looked at larger context window 100k input tokens pruning distillation quantization sparsification we also looked at how lora based fine tuning can help devices with limited computation resources such as mobile phone and embedded devices to even fine tune a large language model next we will look at the techniques which are used or which are ongoing the research is going around them to improve the accuracy and diversity of llm the two techniques are facts checking using external sources and knowledge injection using retrieval augmented generation so enhancing the accuracy and correctness of this llms the first is fact checking fact checking basically can be done in different ways such as using external knowledge rule based knowledge semantic matching or n gram matching i will explain that automated feedback or regular expression so suppose we asked a question to llm it gave us a some answer what we can do is we can also look at the web web pages uh, of sim which are returned when similar query is asked and do a semantic matching n gram matching we can also ask for feedback from the user itself like the bar asks for feedback positive negative so, uh, which will help it uh, get better so and also we can use regular expressions when we do some rule based uh, matching so these are the ways in which we can do the fact checking using external sources next is knowledge injection knowledge injection can be done using retrieval augmented generation this method is getting lot of popularity and lot of research is going around it so the method retrieves relevant information from external sources such as web pages and database based on the query and with the query this retrieved information is also passed in the input prompt so that the llm generates text based on query and the retrieved information making it more better and also when we get the result there can be references that we are in web pages or database uh, this answer uh was present so it can get give references of the web pages so that is what happens in this uh, latest uh, uh chats which are integrated with the web search for example microsoft edge or bing has uh, incorporated the bing chat where i asked it how xgboost work, works it gave me an answer with also the relevant document that the answer was based on the reference of these documents so this is a very accurate answer because there is a fact checking based on the retrieved web pages or databases and lot of research is going around it to make it even better till now we looked at how the what are the research going around improving the architecture making it more accurate and uh, fact checked and the last one is addressing the ethical and social challenges of llm basically making it more unbiased so all the ethical and social challenges Uh, should be incorporated so basically llm output should not be biased uh, it should not be harmful and so on so let's look at it so addressing the ethical and so social challenges of llm can be done in various ways one is bias mitigation so ensuring that the output of llm mitigates gender age confirmation or cognitive biases so research is going around bias mitigation around gender age confirmation cognitive and all other sorts of biases also toxicity detection sometimes it can produce risky or harmful or toxic responses so how can we mitigate that and some research are going around like i will just suggest some methods some methods are like filter out toxic text generated by llms by using a toxicity classifier on top of llm output have a toxicity classifier which is trained on human label data preventing harmful or offensive outputs and same thing can be done in the bias mitigation also we can have a classifier which uh, detects these biases and flags them by human label trained on human level data other thing is fairness evaluation making sure that output of llms uh, is fair across different groups like gender age demographic etc and this can be 
done by doing different statistical tasks, coming up with different statistical metrics that output generated is fair. Other is explainability enhancement to ensure that the output of uh, LLM has the right explanation. So basically using attention mechanism and causal inference techniques to understand that given that input, why did it produce a particular output? What, which words or which portion of the query it gave more importance to? So use it, it will enhance the transparency and interpretability of uh, LLMs. So that's it. Uh, in this video where I wanted to cover most of the research in which topics it's going and which are the clever tricks uh, and techniques that people are using and uh, coming out with. Uh, also a part of it, one more topic is getting a lot of popularity that is AutoGPT. What is AutoGPT? AutoGPT is an AI agent. It's just a coded AI agent that given a goal in natural language, just in English language, it will attempt to achieve it by breaking it into subtasks and using the internet tools like GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 APIs in an automatic loop to perform autonomous tasks. So basically, uh, we give it a goal. It will try to use these models to break down that goal into subtask and repeatedly keep calling APIs to solve its subtask till it feels that that subtask is solved. For example, if I ask, give it a goal of writing a book, it, the subtask can be conduct research, create an outline, write the chapters, edit the book and finally publish. And for each subtask, it can again call the internet or GPT APIs to solve it uh, recursively. So that is the AP, uh, AI agent. It's early and a lot of research is going around it. So that's it in this video where we looked at since the arrival of this chat GPT and BART type of models, where all the research is going around and what we can see in the future. And also we have a brief about all these techniques. The idea of this video was not to give an accurate and in-depth explanation of all the techniques, but give an idea about all these techniques. So if you want to read more about some particular techniques, you have the awareness and you have that intuition. And then you can read the paper, get more understanding, more detailed idea of it. Hope you like the video. Uh, please like and subscribe. Stay tuned and see you in the next video. Bye.